Good morning. Um, uh, extremely happy to uh, be here and was thrilled to get the invitation. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Great. Um, uh, so thank you very much uh, for that warm introduction. I am going to try to do sort of two things today, and, and hopefully I, I didn't, pardon the pun, uh, bite off more than I can chew. I am going to simultaneously sort of situate, pardon me? That was a pun. That was a pun. <laughs> Uh, in, in the world of food, there's sort of hard to escape. Uh, I'm going to sort of simultaneously try to get us to think about food in a different way, meaning think about food as a system, and then talk a bit about sort of how we are currently working, and I'm, I'm involved in a project here in Onondaga County uh, called Food Plan CNY, uh, and we do have a website if anybody's interested. This is a an ongoing project that I'm doing with a colleague from uh, the State University of New York College of Environmental Science and Forestry that's working to um, uh, be a little bit more deliberate here in central New York and, and how we manage or govern or intervene in the normal operating of our food system. Um, uh, I am from a new program at Syracuse University, Food Studies. Uh, as of um, 2014, a student could actually come to Syracuse University and earn a Bachelor of Science in Food Studies. Um, and as of 2016, we, we now offer a Master's of Science in Food Studies. Um, and this is really sort of an emerging field uh, in the academy, sort of across parts of Western Europe, especially throughout the United Kingdom and in the United States and Canada, so North America, that's thinking about sort of the ways in which we uh, want to more deliberately engage in, in thinking about uh, food rather than sort of allow it um, to be uh, simply controlled by the market, mostly because we recognize that it isn't solely controlled by the market. Somebody remarked uh, in the introduction that, that a great deal of our food is produced through undocumented workers. That is a very clear example where uh, failure of government policies um, is, is sort of creating unevenness in how the food system operates, which is actually very detrimental in this example um, to growers in, in the Northeast. Um, so I'm going to start today by sort of introducing food and, and, and uh, something that we're obviously quite familiar with, but, but thinking about food through a systems perspective, which, which um, is not necessarily new or unique per se, but is now emerging on the public consciousness like never before. And I'm going to talk a little bit about sort of the process of food system planning, uh, and then ground that by talking about what we're doing here in central New York. Um, just through a few brief examples from this ongoing project, which we, which we are uh, not yet complete with. Um, and then finally, uh, if time permits, uh, touch on a few of the emerging opportunities that we see here um, to, to strengthen um, the central New York food system. Normally, uh, we think of food uh, as this image depicts, something that we consume. If you look up the, the definition of food, um, in the dictionary, uh, you will find more or less something that reads nourishment in solid form. But that definition is inadequate for uh, touching upon, highlighting, uh, and explicating on the importance of food. Um, food is one of our most important economic activities. Right now, when we have a, a presidential administration that's engaging in uh, trade wars um, with you know, uh, sort of former allies or current allies around the country. Um, the front line in the United States of that trade war are, are, is our food system, our agricultural producers. Um, you know, it, it, there's no mistake that the first thing China targeted when thinking about what tariffs they wanted to levy against us in retaliation, uh, they targeted the hog industry. Um, and food has, of course, been of great economic importance historically. It's also important sort of object of both pleasure and concern. Um, somebody was just offered a, a piece of bread today a minute ago and, and the response was, well, that, that's not something I can consume. So there's sort of a lot of thought that goes into sort of what we put in our bodies. I work with young people. 
Um, and they're very conscious of what they're eating, especially in the springtime when they're getting ready for what they refer to as swimsuit season. Um, it's also the place where, for example, on college campuses, students uh, make new friends. It's a place where we socialize. Um, and so it's really sort of occupying this um, sort of difficult position and that it's something that we both use as celebration and something that we are constantly sort of worrying about. It's also essential for life, right? You can go longer without food than you can go without oxygen or go without water. Um, but the body needs food um, uh, to survive. Um, and simultaneously, we also have this paradox that it's also one of the most important causes of disease and death, premature death uh, in, the United States, in the United States today, um, if not caused by accident, is, is caused by uh, chronic disease, uh, normally um, uh, caused by um, problematic consumption habits. Uh, it's central to our personal, social, and cultural identities. Uh, and it's a fundamental connection between people and places. It's how most of us uh, encounter nature. It's how humans have transformed the world around them um, uh, to make our, our world uh, inhabitable. And it's not uh, an overstatement to say that the domestication of plants and animals, that is the advent of sedentary agriculture, was the greatest technical achievement in all of human history. Agriculture makes civilization, makes culture, makes what we all do possible. And agriculture literally remade the world physically, socially, and politically. You can't fly over the continental United States without literally seeing the impact of humans on the landscape. And that impact is a result of using nature and natural resources uh, for economic activity um, but also for agricultural activity. That said, the importance of food uh, was in some ways uh, overlooked uh, for most of our recent history. That is, we took it for granted. Um, and we wind up today in, in sort of the year 2018 at a place where uh, we are now really rethinking our relationship to food. Uh, the famous food journalist um, Michael Pollan uh, sort of sums up this contradiction in our relationship in the United States to food when, when he asks, quote, how did we ever get to a point where we need investigative journalists to tell us where our food comes from and nutritionists to determine the dinner menu? Right? Pollan is very clearly here highlighting this disconnect between the ways in which people have historically sustained themselves uh, and the relationship that many of us now have to food. We don't fully understand where our food comes from. Uh, many young people, uh, um, and I'm not just talking about uh, city dwellers, but, but lots of the folks that I encounter at Syracuse University, students who um, you know, come from more privileged backgrounds, really have no sense of where food comes from. They don't know what it looks like. I mean, many of us in upstate New York might have gone apple picking as a, as a recreational activity in the fall. Um, and then there's all of this sort of concern about what we ought to be eating uh, and how, right? You can't sort of read the paper without seeing sort of the newest dietary guidelines, which are constantly shifting, right? At one point it was avoid trans fats. Uh, at one point it was avoid sugar, right? And, and clearly some of this is really important, you know, depending on our individual bodies. Uh, but that is to say that, that we are at a, at a moment in history where there is a crisis in our food system. Um, and and the, the farmer poet Wendell Berry sort of highlights this uh, when he notes, today the consumer is, quote, an industrial eater who does not know that eating is an agricultural act, who no longer knows or imagines the connections between eating and the land and who is therefore necessarily passive and uncritical. Wendell Berry here is highlighting the connections between what we do when we sit down uh, for a meal and the extensive system, the food system, that brings that food to our plates. He is highlighting a new way of recognizing and thinking about food, and that is through a systems perspective. It is because of the emerging crisis, 
right? The fact that we constantly hear that this generation is likely to die younger and sicker than any previous generation, that life expectancy uh, is, is not yet declining, but is on the verge of actually declining in the United States, that there is increased public awareness around food and food issues. So, for example, you can see you know, a great deal of bestsellers. Uh, here's an image of the Fast Food Nation book. Uh, Michael Pollan himself, obviously, is a notable food writer, uh, wrote the, the bestseller Omnivore's Dilemma. Um, the top left photo uh, is the entrance to Empire Brewery in Armory Square in downtown Syracuse. It says, eat where you live. Right, so there's this new recognition of the importance and central role that food plays in our lives. And recognition that business as usual is problematic for human health and for the environment. What this conjures up is this notion of a food system. Uh, and the question is, of course, step first, what is a food system? How do we know what a food system is when we see it? When we think in systems, some systems are easier to define than others. We can talk about the constitutive parts, we can talk about open and closed systems, we can talk about the body as a system, for example, comprised of various systems. But when we talk about food, what, what actually is a food system? Does anybody recognize this photo here? This is a part of a food system that, that we're all really familiar with. Uh, this is the parking lot at the, at the Wegmans uh, in DeWitt, actually. Uh, and we don't often think about, about this, this space uh, as, as part of the food system. Um, but we ought to, because it is reflective of the profound shifts that have occurred over the past couple of decades uh, in how we um, manage, govern, and, and, and um, uh, access food. A food system, and here's a diagram, uh, a complex diagram that's not entirely clear in this room, uh, connects the various parts of food into a conceptual whole. So another way to think about it is a food system <coughs> is the set of interlinked institutions and processes that transform solar energy, water, and soil nutrients into food. It includes a series of related elements that provide food to a community, and it's inclusive of the social, political, economic, and environmental context of these processes. So what's important to note here in my definition of a food system is we're not just talking about a supply chain, whereby food starts on the farm, it gets harvested, it might get graded and sorted and processed and packaged and transported and maybe processed again and transported again, moving through warehouse and finally to a retail store consumed and then of course waste is, a, is an important part of the food system. We're thinking about that supply chain, but we're also putting that supply chain into its context. So we think about the political uh, context in which a food system operates. We're mindful of the economic uh, and environmental and social context of that food system because those all have direct influence on how our food system operates. The United States uh, food policy is uh, most clearly impacted at the federal level by what we refer to as the Farm Bill, which is currently being debated uh, as we speak. Uh, over the last sort of couple of decades, the Farm Bill was the one place that you could continually count on bipartisan, actual congressional efforts underway, right? It's the one place Congress actually continued to do their work. Uh, no longer is that something we can say uh, as of this current administration. Um, the Farm Bill is, a, is an omnibus bill that is a, usually a five-year bill that is billions and billions of dollars. Okay, it is the largest federal um, policy that directly engages in food and agriculture. It sh literally shapes what we consume and produce. Um, so when we're thinking about food as a system, we're not just thinking about sort of connecting the dots from farm to fork, as the saying would go. We're thinking about sort of what impacts those systems, what shapes that system. 
And we're recognizing that the food system itself is linked to a whole host of other systems, right? Uh, and this includes ecological systems, transportation systems, housing, water, open space, energy, economy, public health, right? We often think about, say, for example, the, the large Do, uh, Wegmans and DeWitt, which, if I'm not mistaken, is the largest Wegmans um, uh, in their um, chain of stores, as being located at, at a place that's easy for consumers to get to. Uh, actually, more important for locating grocery stores uh, is access to the transit networks that bring the goods to the store, right? So they're located right off 481 because that allows their tractor trailers to unload in the middle of the night so that um, we can shop there uh, as we want and find what we want when we want it. So we have this concept of a food system, right, which is, a, again, not a new way per se to think about food but a new way to think about how we directly intervene uh, deliberately in that system. Uh, and over the past decade, the food system has enjoyed increased attention uh, from planners and policymakers. Right? One of the reasons, in addition to sort of the fraught sort of political times that we live in, that we see such debate over the farm bill today, uh, is that we are having consumers and consumer advocacy groups beginning to weigh in more deliberately so that the Farm Bill is no longer sort of left to uh, congressional leaders from the Midwest to sort of argue for their rural interests and congressional leaders from the coasts who are interested in ensuring that food stamp recipients have adequate access to food dollars. We're starting to see ways in which people are thinking about uh, more deliberately shaping agricultural policy to align uh, with the sort of food system that we'd like to see. One that uh, supports public health rather than hinders it, uh, and one that contributes to ecological services rather than undermines it. So why food system interventions? Why do we now see food as sort of a place where people are directly engaged in? Well, first and foremost, there's just increased public awareness. What we refer to in the social sciences as wicked problems, these large, complex, difficult problems, climate change being sort of a chief example, a lot of them directly tie to food, right? Whether we're talking about sort of our healthcare crisis, uh, or we're talking about climate change, or we're thinking about sort of uh, the ways in which our economy operates, or again, you know, sort of our broken immigration system, all of these directly tie to how our food system is structured and how it functions. So food system interventions are emerging, uh, one, because there's a clear recognition that the market uh, is, is not working adequately. There are social health, uh, health and environmental externalities that are not reflected in the prices that, that one pays for food. Uh, there's a great deal of growing concentration and a lack of transparency in our food system. And, and policy and planning are, are emerging as effective means for addressing a whole host of contradictions produced by the food system. Moreover, there are increasingly recognized opportunities to have positive local impacts in relationship to a globalized system. Right? That is that there are opportunities to intervene in ways that allow us to strengthen our food system to achieve the sorts of outcomes that are desired by key stakeholders. And one just needs to breeze through the newspaper to see how clearly uh, food is on the agenda. There have been recent debates over a proposed uh, manure storage unit in Lafayette. Uh, the grocery store, no James Brothers, on the west side, uh, third generation grocer closed it after nearly 100 years in business, right? And that grocery store was not only located in a very poor neighborhood where residents were dependent on being able to walk to a grocery store to meet their food needs, but it was also located near a school uh, and, and the owner, Paul Nojang, donated weekly produce to help ensure school children 
uh, had uh, healthful food to consume. It's located uh, adjacent to public housing complex uh, that where a great deal of senior citizens reside. Uh, we see food distribution uh, outlets in central New York expanding. Uh, just recently, TOPS filed for bankruptcy. Um, we have a renewed interest, uh, uh, at least at the state level, um, in, in ensuring uh, schools, students uh, don't go hungry. The Syracuse City School District now provides free lunch and breakfast to every single child in the district because we have passed a threshold where more than 65% of the kids qualify. And by removing the forms, the application as a barrier to participation, they can ensure kids uh, eat at least two meals a day. They are now partnering with a private foundation uh, to actually provide some of the kids with backpacks stuffed with food on Friday to take home for the weekend. Just this week, uh, an undocumented uh, young mother uh, was murdered, uh, indicating, uh, and, and again, sort of highlighting the reliance of our food system uh, on undocumented immigrants, um, and thinking about sort of the complex relationship uh, our food system has with the immigration system. Uh, and just yesterday, uh, and to end on a bit of good news, uh, one farm uh, in, in the, the uh, Skinny Atlas watershed, which is very important uh, as it provides our water system, uh, won a national sustainability award uh, for effective management of, of cow waste. So that is to say that food is on the agenda like never before, uh, and we see a whole host of opportunities to better uh, engage in managing that system and shaping it through planning and policy in ways that might achieve better economic, public health, and environmental outcomes. Notably, here in central New York, our economic leaders recognize the importance of agriculture and food as an economic development opportunity. Uh, in CNY Rising, which is the economic development sort of um, agenda for Central New York, uh, published by Center State uh, CEO, which is the economic development leader uh, in Central New York. There was a recent recognition of the economic opportunities that at least agricultural production provides for Central New York. Central New York agribusiness uh, uh, produced $2.9 billion worth of economic activity in 2013. Agribusiness contributes $53 billion annually to New York State. And in central New York, there are 3,500 farms plus an additional 200 food processing companies that employ over 4,000 people, right? So there is a recognition of the economic importance of agriculture. However, our economic leaders are also missing key opportunities because they are not engaged in thinking about food as a system. Instead, thinking about those moments where food occur as opportunity to leverage uh, economic activity. Uh, and this is one example uh, from this report where they're looking at Cuga milk ingredients. Uh, and I'll read the little blurb. It says, Cuga milk ingredients, uh, a Central New York Regional Economic Development Council round one grant recipient has been operating at full capacity in its new 105,000 square foot milk processing facility since January 2015. Is that Evan? Yes. Is that uh, Burn Dairy? Uh, no, this is Cuga Milk, which is another milk processing facility in Cuga County. So this is not the Burn Dairy facility or the ultra high process facility that's in um, uh, DeWitt. Um, this is, this is another milk <laughs> facility altogether. And I'll talk about dairy in one second. One of the things that they're sort of trying to leverage Cuban milk for is increased export opportunities uh, to Eurasian markets. 60% of the product coming out of Cuban milk is powder for China. The other 40% is <laughs> Philadelphia cream cheese, which is produced just north of here in Lauville. 
However, in pouting the economic importance of dairy in central New York and our processing facilities, the focus is on export rather than thinking about how we might do more to develop our local markets. So to that end, we are launching Food Plan CNY, or, or, or we launched Food Plan CNY. And this is a project that has come out of the Onondaga County Agricultural Council that was created by County Executive Joni Mahoney in 2012 to, quote, ensure that the county government is working to promote and preserve Onondaga County's strong farming community, as well as strengthen and enhance the connections between the county's urban core to rural agricultural areas. In setting up the Onondaga County Agriculture Council, our county executive had the foresight to think about food as a system, recognizing that although we have extensive agricultural production in central New York, we are an urban county with a large municipality sitting right in the center of our county. And there are new opportunities to think about how we build connections that would benefit us all. So the Onondaga County Agricultural Council is supporting my project that I'm conducting with my colleague Matt Potiger at SUNY ESF, and that is Food Plan CNY. And Food Plan CNY is a project whose goals are to enhance the economic, environmental, and public health outcomes of the central New York food system by developing a baseline assessment of the food system, right? That is, if we want to intervene in our food system, we have to first understand how it is structured. We need to know what there is before we start tinkering with it. To think about how we better coordinate that food system so there's not a whole host of independent actors operating on their own, but that they are starting to communicate with each other and finally, to engage the public in thinking in more deliberate ways about our food system. Notably, we are taking an assets-based approach. And this is a particular approach to thinking about policy and planning that is different from the traditional problem-solving approach. Onondaga County and the city of Syracuse uh, is, the city in particular is really infamous for the problems that it has. It's recognized as having deep-seated poverty, ongoing problems with uh, uh, inequality, concentrated poverty. We were recently determined to have the highest levels of concentrated poverty among black and Latino uh, residents in the entire United States, uh, a school district that is continually viewed to be underperforming, uh, economic uh, development that is lagging, unemployment that outpaces the United States. However, we are taking an approach that instead recognizes the current assets we have and an attempt to think about what is working and how might we uh, better support what is working rather than to understand gaps and problems and tackle it that way. So we're thinking about how to identify existing assets and better leverage those assets for social, environmental, and economic well-being. As one of our interviewees noted early in the project, quote, how can you pursue policy if you're not really thinking about what's happening? You have to value the assets you have. You have to first identify them and then really value them. So we are taking an assets-based approach to thinking about uh, food system opportunities. So let me tell you a little bit about how the project is actually working. Uh, so we're trying to develop a framework for coordinating the food system of central New York through a participatory planning pro process that identifies key food system assets. And participatory is key here, again, because I'm not a farmer, right? Yet in central New York, despite the fact that a lot of us don't recognize it, there are some really viable uh, agricultural producers, really strong farms who are producing for Wegmans, for Walmart, uh, for the new food delivery services in Manhattan, Purple Carrot. Um, uh, and so we need to have the folks who are in the know, the folks who are on the front lines, the folks who are doing this work, participating in our project. 
Uh, I don't work at a food pantry. I don't know what the face of hunger actually looks like on the ground um, in downtown Syracuse, for example. So we're engaging in people who manage soup kitchens, food pantries. Um, Central New York has a number of independent uh, businesses that are, that are still engaged in food distribution. Maybe some of you have seen their trucks, Syracuse Banana, Ginta Produce, Andy's Produce. Those are all viable small businesses, family-run businesses that have been operating in central New York for decades and shifting with the shifting uh, economies of our food system, right? Wegmans no longer sources their food from the regional market, which they once did, right? They now control their, they are signing direct contracts with producers in Ecuador, in Guatemala, in New Zealand. Right? And so we've had this shifting landscape of food, yet we still have a number of businesses, organizations, political leaders who have been flexible, nuanced, and savvy in thinking about the role that they play in that shifting landscape. And so our goal is to tap into that knowledge and to understand that expertise and those experiences. And so we are, partic we are running a project that includes opportunities for the, the actual folks on the front line to be participating in our project. So first what we've done is sort of gathered uh, secondary data and archival data to develop a baseline assessment of the food system. Uh, and we're doing a great deal of mapping to sort of understand connections and food access. Um, we've conducted key informant interviews with everything from farmers, large and small, uh, the largest dairy producer in central New York that's got 4,000 cows um, producing milk, a, a great deal of it. Um, uh, being processed for export um, to the smallest niche producer whose main outlet is Side Hill Farms uh, right here in the, the neighboring parking lot. Um, we are engaging in ongoing review with the participants. So we've had some focus group and stakeholder meetings. Uh, we produced a website and we're working on a report and that what website. That website? The website is foodplancny.org. Food plan, food plan, cny.org. And the website actually has opportunity for people to participate directly in the project. Um, um, uh, and and uh, I should say summer 2018, later this summer, we'll be producing a public report um, uh, reporting on our findings. The outcome of this project will be a food systems plan that provides a baseline assessment of strengths and opportunities and outlines a collaborative framework for food system governance. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some of the examples of the findings that, that, that we currently have. I do want to note some of the ongoing challenges of this project. Uh, one has been sort of simply collecting information um, or gathering data. There's been sort of struggles around accessibility or, or consistency of data. Uh, we're, for example, really interested in data on um, employment within food, and that's really difficult to gather. Uh, one, lots of the workers are undocumented. Uh, the Department of Labor has some sets of data. The USDA, United States Department of Agriculture, has other sets of data. Uh, New York State Department of Agriculture and Market, and they don't necessarily all gather or, or manage or collect data in the same ways. Uh, it's a very complex project, right? Sort of thinking about what the food system is, sort of conceiving of the boundaries to that food system is very difficult, right? Do we in, uh, consider debates on the future of the elevated portion of 81 as part of this debate? Because that's going to have impacts on, on our food system. Are we sort of mindful of uh, the ongoing um, you know, debates around creating an inland port in central New York to help export agricultural products, right? So we really had to sort of continually think about sort of what the parameters of this project are. Um, and then coordinating a whole host of key actors um, is always challenging. So let me talk to you a little bit about some of the baseline findings, right? right this is a snapshot, if you will, of, of how our food system currently operates. In Onondaga County, on average, we consume 2,198,775 pounds of food. This is daily consumption in Onondaga County. Uh, and you can see... You're talking about over a billion pounds of food a year. Oh, yeah. 
Twenty-seven percent of that is uh, protein. The USDA has some averages, uh, and, and the United States Census um, Bureau uh, has some averages. So we, we we've had no less than uh, 30 students working on this project, um, 10 of whom were directly employed as research assistants, and then we had two classes that, that took on different portions of this project. 15% uh, of this consumption is, is fruit, 22% vegetables, uh, and 36% dairy products. Um, uh, daily spending per person, um, so for total food, on average, um, this figure is $9.10. And this is in Onondaga County, the, the orange bars. The red bar is in the city of Syracuse, so on average, uh, folks spend $7.99. So there's a little bit, obviously, of a, a discrepancy, uh, as we would expect. Uh, demand for food is inelastic, right? You can only consume so much. Um, uh, yet, um, if you have a economic opportunity, you are likely to spend a bit more for the same food products, getting higher quality. Um, and then there's a breakdown on how that food is consumed. So at home, uh, in Onondaga County, there's an average of $5.16 uh, per day. In the city of Syracuse, $4.87. And then food away from home, on average in Onondaga County, it's $3.95 and $3.13 daily um, in, the, in the city of Syracuse. And then there's a breakdown um, by, by product. Right, so this gives us a sense of, of what people are consuming uh, on average um, in um, uh, Onondaga County in the city of Syracuse. Uh, annual spending um, for, for the average citizen in the city of Syracuse on food is $2,918. Uh, and annual spending on average in Onondaga County for an individual is $3,322. Right, so there's considerable amounts of food being consumed, obviously, in Onondaga County. Now, I we would, all, yes? I would assume that that includes your daily Starbucks. Uh, yes, it does. Okay. Yep. That, that some people are privileged. Right? Absolutely, and, and, um, um, and we can talk a little bit more about sort of, you know, and that's a place where even though there's inelasticity in consumption, right, food, Companies have been sort of savvy in thinking about how to expand um, access to consumer dollars. Uh, here's an overview of the top uh, products produced in central New York, the five county region, Onondaga County in the middle. Um, our largest product is uh, dairy. Uh, we produce uh, 79 um, million dollars worth, 79 and a half million dollars. Uh, worth of, of dairy product per year in Onondaga County alone, uh, and that's about 52% of, of our agricultural output. Uh, corn is our next largest product. A great deal of that is feed for dairy. So if you're driving through the landscape outside of um, the city or suburban areas into rural areas, you're going to see a great deal of uh, field corn. Uh, much of that is uh, owned and produced by dairy operators. They use the fields as a way to distribute the animal waste and then produce food that then gets run through their animals. Um, so in many ways there's um, opportunities to enhance these closed systems. Uh, and then our third largest um, product is, is poultry and eggs. Um, and of course we used to have major uh, turkey processing uh, facility in central New York that has disappeared. They still produce turkeys. They're not um, processed there. Um, and that's uh, almost $14 million worth of product. Um, and, and overall, in, in the uh, five county region, um, dairy is our largest product, followed by corn, and then followed by cattle and calves. Uh, and, and upstate New York and central New York in particular is, actually has uh, some recognition for really high quality Angus beef production. We're not actually producing uh, meat here, but
but we're engaged in um, breeding high quality animals that then get shipped off to the Midwest, indicating again how this system has been sort of divided in recent history. At one point, animals would have spent their entire life in the same place uh, and then just been shipped off to a local slaughterhouse. Uh, now the animals are bred um, and then shipped off um, to feedlots. Uh, there is some crop diversity in, in central New York. Um, we produce uh, uh, just shy of seven million dollars worth of um, vegetables, melons, potatoes, and sweet potatoes in Onondaga County. Um, almost two million dollars worth of uh, fruits and tree nuts. Um, and just shy of a million dollars worth of berries. Uh, however, this is really small portion of our production. Vegetables is 4.4%. Fruit and tree nuts is 1.3%, and berries is uh, less than um, one-tenth of a percent. We've also gathered some data on... I get to look at my children. <laughs> Do you discuss this subject at dinner time with your children? <laughs> A bit, yes. <laughs> um, uh, so we're also, in addition to sort of looking at agriculture, we're going to sort of jump here and we, we talked about, you know, we're, we also met with processors and distributors, um, but I just want to jump to sort of give you a couple snippets of this project. Uh, we also are looking at sort of the shifting ways in which people access food in central New York. Uh, in 1935, there was 925 grocery stores operating in the city of Syracuse. In 2015, there were only 24. Uh, in 1935, there's 1,107 stores and grocery stores in Onondaga County total, including Syracuse. Today, there are only 59. So this highlights a great deal of concentration um, in uh, food retailing. Today there is also 143 corner stores in the city of Syracuse. Right? These are the places that are ubiquitous in, in urban America selling you know, malt liquor, tobacco products, uh, salty and sugary junk food, lottery tickets, lottery tickets <laughs> and, and very expensive and other sorts of foods. When you, and they charge more. Yeah. When you use these figures, are you considering, like in 1935, the small mom and pop stores compared to in 2015, Absolutely. the large uh, uh, supermarket? And that's exactly what one of that's exactly what this illustrates, right? Is that you've had concentration, even today that still includes. So this was in 2015. So no James was still operating. Dominic's, so a grocery store is, is defined by the federal government, by the United States Department of Agriculture, as a store that has a full service produce department. And then there are supermarkets, and that includes uh, a certain total number of square feet. Um, so today, the world's largest food retailer is Walmart. That's the largest food retailer in the, in the United States as well. Um, and they would be considered part of, of, of these figures. Would the regional market come involved here? No, the regional market we are not including as a grocery store um, uh, because it's not open uh, daily. The regional market is one of the key assets uh, in central New York that we have um, in terms of thinking about what a food system could be. Um, and the central New York regional market is increasingly viewed as a model um, across the United States. And one of the key things that we have in the regional market, well, we have three key things. One is it's a public entity. It's actually a state authority, just like the Thruway or the Port Authority. It is the only New York State authority that continually operates in the black, right? But it's also public, right? Meaning that, that the ordinary citizen can actually sort of uh, weigh in in certain ways in how the market operates. And the market has to be responsive to the public. Yes? On a Saturday, May, June, July, August, and September, you need a pass from two folks, <laughs> seven principals, to get a parking space over there in the regional market. Yes. And 
Unless you get there at 4 o'clock in the morning, you're dead to the water. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so that is certainly one of the things that, that, that the um, executive director of the regional market is very attentive to, is thinking about the, the struggles around. Sooner or later, they have to put, put a, fence, a, a way to, to stop the growth of that thing. It's just, it's, you, you need a note from home to get a license to get in there. Yeah. You gotta know somebody. Yeah. So, but, so let me just say that two other really important sort of opportunities that the regional market presents is um, they were actually a model for the ways in which you could accept food stamp dollars at a regional market. So they were the, one of the first in the country. They actually have a booth where everybody can come. Uh, food stamps are now called SNAPS. So it's a Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. It's on a uh, plastic card, like a debit card or credit card. And you can go to a central uh, location in the market, swipe it, and they will give you wooden tokens that you can then turn into any farmer at the market, and they can uh, exchange that for cash at the end of the day. Uh, they will also incentivize it, giving you an extra dollar for all every five dollars you spend. And this is really important uh, because, uh, unfortunately, many people are reliant on federal food dollars, um, and federal food dollars are recognized for being insufficient at meeting food needs. And we recognize that people who are reliant on them uh, have a, a worse diet than, than the average citizen. Um, on a, any given Saturday, there are over 20,000 people who pass through that market during harvest season, and they have 400 unique vendors. Those are all small business owners. Additionally, and this is where actually the regional market is getting a great deal of attention nationwide, there's a co-location of retail and wholesale at the market, right? And what this means is that the producer has one place to go, and they can unload a great deal of their product to any of the distributors who can then take it to independent grocery stores, can fill in the gaps at Wegmans, can take it to restaurants. Yeah, well, well, those buildings are not the sheds. Those buildings are on the right as you come into the, the center off of Park Street. You see Quinta, Russo, exactly. a couple of the other guys that I, okay, and they are distributors. They sell to the restaurants and to the stores and to the small little guys in the nursing homes and the schools and exactly. whatever. Exactly. And so the regional market is definitely one of our uh, uh, real important assets um, here in central New York. Now to that end, and this is a bit of a difficult graphic um, that doesn't translate as well to the screen as it does in print, uh, so I'm gonna talk you through this. We have a great deal of opportunity in direct sales. So this is a graph, graphic looking at direct sales um, in central New York, only 2.8% of total food sales in Onondaga County or from direct sales, meaning direct from the producer to the consumer, okay? That equates to uh, over $3 million worth of sales, but that pales in comparison to the daily uh, expenditures and the annual expenditures on food. So one of the things that we identify through this project is a great deal of growth opportunities for uh, independent businesses to engage in more direct sales. Onondaga contributes uh, largely because of the regional market, 35% of the total profit made in direct sales for all of central New York. So there's a great deal of growth opportunities in the surrounding counties uh, in central New York um, and increasing opportunities um, here uh, in Onondaga County um, uh, uh, to ramp up and expend uh, direct sales. Um, Are any of those numbers, uh, the, the little market in Manlius on Thursday? Yes. There's a market, I think, on Saturdays in Chazanopia. Yep. And there's a market in Manlius that could blow through about seven minutes. Yep. Yeah, there's, there's, a, there's actually a little market uh, right in my neighborhood on the corner of Westcott and Euclid on Wednesdays. Yep, so that, that includes okay, those... Uh, the community building there? Yep, 
And so that, that figure also includes community supported agriculture, which is a new model of food distribution whereby um, uh, consumers become members of a farm, much like you would subscribe to a magazine. Uh, you give the, the producer a membership fee in the winter before the season starts so the grower can complete their marketing during the quiet time of the year. Uh, it helps them uh, access capital needed uh, for the growing season, uh, and it helps them to determine what to plant. How do you and, find those people? And then over the course of the year, uh, uh, over the course of the growing season, you get weekly uh, produce boxes. So you, you just sort of consume what the farmer is growing, and they do their best to create diverse so food boxes. savings to that. Uh, yeah, you produce. definitely, there's definitely major savings. Um, and, and actually, Side Hill Farms, the, the sort of butcher deli right in the neighboring parking lot. Are people familiar with Side Hill? So they, they if, if, they're really wonderful. All they're of their meat. The they're on the end of the, where the Rite Aid store is and where the dry cleaner is and where the two or three hairdressers are. They're in, right in the corner. There. Yep. So and everything they that they the sell is produced in central New York. Uh, and they have very, very high quality meats that are all from local farmers. Um, so they actually have a meat CSA, believe it or not. So you can, it's community supported agriculture. You could subscribe and get a delivery of processed meat every month, for example. Um, and there's a number of community supported agriculture projects throughout central New York. Actually, the, the largest community supported agriculture project east of the Mississippi uh, is located um, in Cortland County, uh, and they have over 2,000 members. Um, so direct sales include community-supported agriculture as well. The um, Farmers Market Federation of New York State is actually uh, located right in Fayetteville, or headquarters right in Fayetteville, uh, and they do a great deal of work to expand farmers markets uh, throughout New York State. Uh, and here, finally, is some uh, baseline data looking at some of the public health outcomes of our food system. Um, so the top left is the percentage of adults uh, who consume one or more sugary drinks daily. This is uh, soda or sports drinks, uh, and that's a full quarter of us, 25% in Onondaga County. The percentage of adults who consume fast food at least three times per week is just shy of 8%. The percentage of adults who eat five or more servings of fruits and vegetables per day, which is the federal uh, nutrition guidelines, is only a third of us, right? Meaning only 33.7% of Onondaga County residents are eating the recommended uh, amounts of uh, fruits and vegetables daily. Uh, and almost 25% of adults in Onondaga County have experienced food insecurity in the past year, meaning that they don't know where their next meal is coming from. Yeah. The bottom left, we have 8.6% uh, of adults in Onondaga County are diagnosed uh, with type 2 diabetes. 2.8% um, of adults in Onondaga County are diagnosed with physician uh, diagnosed pre-diabetes. Uh, this number is likely inadequate for actually capturing um, how many people are uh, defined as pre-diabetic. This is physician diagnosed. 25% uh, of adults um, have physician diagnosed high blood pressure. Again, likely uh, uh, undercounting the number of folks with high blood pressure in Onondaga County. And 33.5% percentage of the adults in Onondaga County have elevated cholesterol, right? So that is to say that we have significant diet-related disease in Onondaga County. Um, and so this is our baseline, right? This is sort of what the, the picture we're trying to paint, that we have a great deal of assets and increasing opportunity to leverage those assets for economic, public health, and environmental outcomes. So now that we've done this baseline sort of assessment, what we're starting to do is talk to key stakeholders to get a sense of what some of the critical issues in the food system are. And I just want to touch on, I think, two of these. Uh, and so what we do is we interview key stakeholders, 
And then we work to triangulate that data, meaning find other data sources to support the findings from the interview. One of the key things that we've uh, found when talking to um, producers in particular in Onondaga County uh, is that land and access to land serves as a detriment to new farmers and to farm expansion. As one uh, interviewee noted, uh, it's very hard to access even a 20-acre field around here. Uh, another set of critical issue for us is figuring out how to maintain the urban-rural balance. We're an urban county with massive suburban growth over the past 30 to 40 years. Or a third person noted, down here in the southern part of the county, we don't see pressures from suburbanization, but the big dairy guys are sucking up all the land. They need it, and they can pay for it. So notably, what we see when we look at Onondaga County, which is not spatially a very large, geographically a very large county, are very different pressures governing land markets. In the northern part of the county, uh, around Cicero, North Syracuse, for example, suburban development is, is eating valuable farmland. In the southern part of the county, it's massive expansion of large dairy that is gobbling up farmland. And in both cases, they shape farm prices. So if you want to be a smaller producer or if you want to engage in diversified vegetable production that has thinner margins, it becomes increasingly difficult uh, to access the sorts of land that you want. Notably, we see that this is, um, uh, these findings from our interview are reinforced um, by other data sources. Uh, this is a map of Onondaga County, uh, and if you can see the, the, the uh, green background is total prime farmland. On the left-hand map, it's in the 1950 urban area, <coughs> largely just the city of Syracuse with some northern uh, towns. Uh, and then you have um, the 1950 and 2010 urban areas in the right-hand map again overlaid with total prime farmland. At this point you see um, you know, uh, urban development uh, exceeding well beyond the municipal boundaries, traveling all around Onondaga Lake, moving very clearly up into the northern part of the county. Right? And so we actually have aerial uh, photographs uh, and land survey maps that reinforce the findings from our interviews that are indicating some of the challenges that farmers are facing in accessing the sorts of lands that they need uh, for food production. Um, and this, uh, Evan, yes? So when a Walmart comes along, or if it's Egan, or Steve Ayala comes along, because he's got, well, the Walmarts in the back, in his back pocket, some guys like that. Yep. And he says, I can buy this strip here and put uh, 75,000 square feet of store or 200,000. And he says to a farmer, I want to buy your land. How does that farmer say, eh, that was the time to get it up? So, this is a great example of what planning and policy can do. It's a great question. Right? So, so we have extensive pressures on our producers, not just in central New York, nationwide and globally, right? I mean, some of you might know about sort of the ongoing crisis of farmer suicide in the country of India, for example, right? We have a very rapidly changing food system globally and enormous pressures, downward pressures put on producers, right? The price that you spend at the grocery store, the restaurant, right? The producer is getting pennies on the dollar, okay? And then we have a graying farm, farmer population, right? Uh, the last agricultural census was the first time in 50 years that they saw a slight uptick in the number of farmers. For the past 50 years, the number of farmers in the United States has been decreasing. And that makes sense, right? Because more people can produce, fewer people can produce more. And finally, we're starting to see that shift, right? So we have this grain farm population and a great, you know, not sufficient numbers of people who want to get into 
uh, farming, and it becomes really attractive to, to either sell your farm, if you're in the southern part of the county, your 100, 150 head dairy to the large guy down the road, um, or in the northern part of the county, for example, to sell your farm for development. We now have in New York State uh, farmland protection policy that allows a farmer to sell what are called the development rights of their farm to New York State in exchange for a cash infusion that still allows them to own their land and could still allow them to sell their land but only for other agricultural purchases uh, purposes. So if you have a farm and you say look as a farm, the land value is X. But as development property, the farm value is Y. And I'm ready to retire. My kids are not getting into the industry. There's not enough people who want this land for agriculture. I need the premium that the developer is going to pay. New York State can actually come in and, and cover that difference, right? Subsidized? Subsidized. And purchase the development rights from the farm, which then still remains part of the sort of private property system and can still be transferred. You can still then sell your farm, but only to someone who's going to put it into agricultural uses. So what it does is it makes farmland more uh, accessible to new entry farmers, right? Because the costs, they're not competing with the Steve Aiello's, they're competing with other farmers, right? Even if that's still a challenge, say, because of dairy, it's still a, a much more even playing field. And the seller, the current landowner, has the access to the sorts of resources he or she needs uh, to retire, to you know, move into another phase. What's the status of seafood farming? Um, so, so we talk about, so a great deal of, of seafood is farmed, right? The bulk of salmon we consume in the United States is farmed. The bulk of shrimp that we consume is farmed. There's not extensive seafood farming in the Northeast. Um, and it, a lot of times when we're talking about seafood farming, uh, say, you know, with, with tuna and salmon, you're actually talking about wild-caught animals that are then penned and fattened rather than actually sort of ranched in the same way that we would breed cows. Um, uh, this is increasingly an attention of people who are concerned about food safety. A great deal of shrimp, for example, comes from parts of Southeast Asia where there is uh, not adequately food safety regulations um, to meet the standards of, of you know, <coughs> I mean, anybody wants to stay alive in some cases, but um, so there are some examples in central New York of tilapia being produced. Um, there's a farm in um, Cortland. It's actually a, an urban farm located uh, in the city that, that produces tilapia in these giant tanks um, through a, an aquaponic system. So they have uh, sort of dug into the ground six foot deep about 100 yard long uh, fish tanks, two of them parallel side by side. They have hundreds of tilapia in there and then they pump the water to the top of this three tiered system that, and then <coughs> water, wastewater moves by gravity through these three tiers and the plants filter the water by taking up the f fish nutrients and then the water, by the time it returns to the tank, is, is clean for the fish. Um, that's, it's a farm called Main Street Farms. You can purchase their tilapia. They have a CSA. They're at the regional market. How about the rooftop farming? That's yeah. uh, coming, isn't it? Yeah, and so my dissertation was actually on rooftop farming in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, so I can talk about that. Come next time. We don't see a great deal of, of extensive urban agriculture in Syracuse. There are two urban farms, the one on Midland, which is actually almost six acres within the city of Syracuse. And then there's one that's a, a one acre farm on the south side, uh, simply because we still have land access uh, in ways, of course, Brooklyn does not. Um, um, so urban agriculture and, yep, and rooftop farming is, is definitely a good topic. So we see um, um, green roofs being developed throughout Onondaga County through the Save the Rain program. 
as a way to reduce stormwater runoff. The On Center, for example, downtown has a green roof. It's not producing food. It's sort of lichen and, and sort of you know really hardy plants that that can um, reduce runoff during during high water events. Um, this is just a map, a graphic, which is too difficult also to read on the screen, unfortunately, sorry about that, that's showing the reduction in agricultural areas from 1935 to 2012. Um, you know, so we see a great deal of, of loss of farmland, and this is really important to recognize um, because uh, in the Northeast, we are uh, occupying some of the most productive soils in the entire United States with close proximity to the most important food markets. New York City, Boston, Philadelphia, Toronto are all in close proximity. They're accessible to producers in our region. Um, and and we're, we're recognized, right? I mean, we're familiar with the Finger Lakes wines, for example. Um, which are starting to get international recognition. Uh, and so the loss of farmland has important sort of connotations for the ecology of central New York, right? Just last year, for the first time ever, we found toxic uh, cyanobacteria or blue-green algae in our, in our skinny atlas lake that supplies water to us. I mean, I think, you know, there's over 70 lakes last year in New York State that had documented incidents of blue-green algae, uh, the, the culprit of which is, is nutrient runoff um, from, farm, from agricultural production. A second key issue that emerged from our project uh, is questions of, of access to food in markets. Um, one interview, for example, was noting the development of the new Price Right grocery store uh, on the south side. Um, and, and said, quote, price rate is going to be phenomenally helpful. Thinking about a family that doesn't have access to private transportation, if it's in your neighborhood, in your activity pattern, it's much easier to go to the grocery store. I, for example, take for granted the fact that I can get into my car, I can drive out to Wegmans, I can shop for my family for two weeks, I have the economic uh, and, trans and mobility wherewithal to do that. And, and a lot of folks uh, in our community don't. Another noted, again, thinking about the, the same grocery store that was just built on the south side, this store is a game changer. After next Sunday, which was when the store was gonna open, we will no longer be living in a food desert. A food desert is a shorthand way to think about a neighborhood that is not uh, accessible to food, meaning people are both um, unable to walk to a grocery store, have limited transportation options to get to a grocery store, uh, and have um, limited economic means. Uh, here is a map, a little bit difficult to read, of supermarkets and corner stores in the city of Syracuse. On the left hand side, the map shows all of those purple dots are supermarkets uh, or grocery stores, again places that have uh, full service produce section, meaning you can go there and get lettuce, bananas, apples, onions. Um, everything in the yellow are places where you can't easily access foods. And on the right, these are all the corner stores, right? And you can see significant numbers. Corner stores numbers and grocery stores. Corner stores. Uh, no, on the right hand, this is just the corner stores. You can see significant concentrations in. Um, is it nice and easy, a corner so, store? No, the nice and easy is a convenience store. So Wawa's, say in Pennsylvania, Stewart Shops, nice and easy's, the Burn Dairies, those are all considered convenience stores. Most of the time they're also tied to gas station. Those are chains, right? And they have their own distribution systems. A corner store is an independently operated, in New York City they call them bodega, little grocery store in Spanish. These are the independent um, stores, small stores that occupy urban neighborhoods. And what's important to note about them is because of their size and because of concentration in food distribution, they don't have the ability to, to stock their shelves with healthful foods. They don't have produce sections, right? A nice and easy oftentimes uh, might have a small produce section. A Wawa has a produce section. A burned dairy, you can get a head of lettuce, actually, in most of the burned dairies. If you want to pay. 
Oh, absolutely. And in all cases, convenience stores and corner stores, there's a premium for all foods, whether you're talking about a bag of chips, a can of soda, uh, or a head of lettuce. Um, and what you see, and this is, might be notable for some of you, is, is that there are still independent distribution channels for alcohol, including beer, and snack foods. Right? So soda can get to a small corner store in an urban neighborhood because there are still small distribution networks. Right? Whereas the 18-wheeler full of food, is, with real food, is not going to get to those corner stores. Doesn't pay to go. Right, it doesn't pay them to go because of the shifts in how the food industry has been set up. So here's a, a really interesting, so the, the middle chart looks at the expansion of average size uh, uh, grocery stores throughout history. Beginning uh, in 1917, uh, um, you have the average grocery store was about 2,500 square feet uh, where today they are over 100,000 square feet, right? So you can see exponential growth in the average size of a food retail outlet in the United States. Um, you can see here in, in the bottom graph um, the shift between the ways in which people would access foods. This line are farmers markets, right, which were sort of growing slowly throughout history uh, until about 1900, right, and they began a precipitous uh, decline as the supermarket began to take off. And there's a number of reasons for the growth of the supermarket. One of the main reasons that allowed supermarkets to grow so quickly so early is the UPC code, right? It allowed for standardization of sales. It's that the little barcode on, on any product now that, that one might purchase. If you buy a peach in Wegman, it has the same barcode as a peach in Toy Shop. Absolutely. And the same as a Kroger in Tennessee. Yep. 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 So so the UPC so, so technological shifts, right? And and, and this I want to sort of make a claim I should have made at the beginning. This isn't necessarily all bad, right? Efficiencies can be good, but we need to be mindful of what are the outcomes. Some are intentional and some are not. And, and some of the unintentional outcomes like detriment, are detrimental to public health, have, have harmed our economy here in central New York or undermined our environment. Uh, I don't think you can f clearly see it, which is a shame, but the top two photographs I want to point out, uh, I'm going to put this down so I can walk over. This photograph, and you can see right here in this orange, is Wegmans. The light orange is the actual grocery store, and this is the entire footprint that Wegmans uh, operates with, uh, um, with their parking lot. That is the Wegmans footprint overlaid on my neighborhood, the Westcott neighborhood, which used to have uh, even when I was a child, an independent Big M right on Westcott Street, right? The footprint of Wegmans to Wit consumes almost my entire neighborhood, right? Just highlighting some of the shifts, right? I can no longer walk down to Westcott Street or send my kids to Westcott Street to get a dozen eggs and a gallon of milk without paying a premium. I can get probably those two products because there are three corner stores operating right, right in my neighborhood. Um, but certainly we can't get, say, chicken for the grill. Uh, certainly can't get uh, any fresh fruits or vegetables. One of the corner stores sometimes sells limes for the college kids to make cocktails. Um, right? But you can sort of start to see sort of how these shifts um, manifest here in central New York. Tied to this uh, is another key issue that has emerged, uh, and that is regional distribution. One of the things that we hear from small business owners, be it farmers, processors, or food distributors, all of which are small businesses operating in central New York, is difficulty in getting product to local consumers. And there's a great deal of interest in the local marketplace. 
One small farmer noted in an interview, quote, no ability for small producers to go find a store and get a product onto the shelves. It's simply not possible. Another person noted, I think over the last few years, there's been a big increase in the number of farmers markets and small producers in the area, right? Indicating, for example, the difficulty of uh, getting to the regional market on Saturday or the ubiquity of these little small pop-up farmers markets um, in towns and villages throughout central New York. But we may have reached the point where, you know, we need to find some ways beyond that. We can't, you know, this person's noting that you can't just be dependent on direct sales. We are competing for the same base. We need to grow the base of people who want to buy what we produce. And I don't know how to do that. Right? The interest is in thinking about how to gain a larger share of the normal market. Right? Consumers behave in certain ways. And how can we get the products that we're making here in central New York onto those shelves and into the consumer's hand? Uh, and again, we did some uh, modeling to think about the ways in which the current food supply chain operates. Um, so here you see in the red, the national or global production system, right, which moves through chain distributors and warehouses, um, which is then sold at the supermarket, still occupies a large percentage of what we consume at restaurants, even though there's a sort of increased interest in farm to table, and at institutions. And institutions have emerged as one of the key opportunities in central New York, right? We have large hospitals, we have large school systems, we have large university, uh, we have a few regional colleges, all of which are consuming massive amounts of food, all of which could start to, for example, uh, procure more of their food from local and regional producers. And then the other lines are, are the local producers who don't have access to the, to the chain distributors, right? And they go through local distributors and to the degree that Ginta's Syracuse Banana, Andy's Produce uh, has access to the supermarket chain, it's only to fill in the gaps. It's only when their normal supply chain breaks down, right? And that provides some opportunity because folks, especially when dealing with perishable products, engage in what we refer to as just-in-time delivery systems, right? This is what Walmart and Amazon have, have made so profitable. You don't have large warehouses storing all the milk for when your shelf gets empty, right? You order and maintain and manage your supplies um, to go direct from truck to the store shelves. And so sometimes there's gaps in that system. Sometimes the truck breaks down and tomatoes don't get in. Uh, or sometimes the consumers are asking for local tomatoes. And those are the only times at which local producers and regional distributors can access the larger chains. Uh, so I touched on a couple of just sort of key things, and these are some of many, right, of, of the key things that emerged from our project. Let me just talk to you about how we're starting to sort of think about what this allows us to do. Um, this is a, a photograph of um, regional market in downtown Syracuse. The regional, Central New York Regional Market is the second uh, oldest continually operating farmer's market uh, in New York State. Uh, the first, of course, being in, in or the longest running is, is in Manhattan. Um, and what we've done is we've taken a look at the various uh, data available to us and identified three key ways to think about categorizing the opportunities to strengthen our food system. Uh, these are viability, access, and coordination. First and foremost, uh, we recognize the, the sort of efforts of lots of folks to engage in working hard to maintain a viable food system. Uh, it went unnoticed when we were talking about to any farmer how hard they work to maintain a viable business. Or when we talk to the independent uh, food distributors, um, the efforts they put into maintaining a viable uh, uh, family business. Um, and we think that enhancing the viability of the food system um, could be achieved through more mindful, inclusive economic development, could help in improve the environmental quality, right? thinking about the, the a uh, gentleman whose farm just yesterday was recognized with a national uh, award for environmental stewardship. 
uh, could increase the public health and cultural resilience of our food system. The second opportunity emerges around the concept of access. And when we talk about food and access, most often we sort of put those terms together to think about disparities in access or inequality in access. Some people, uh, especially poor folks living in, in, well, now urban or rural areas, have a hard time accessing food. But in our interviews, we saw that there were a lot of opportunities to improve access, not just for the individual consumer to food, but also for the producer to their local marketplace, or for consumers to uh, information or education. So we see a lot of opportunities around enhancing the access that people have uh, to food, to resources, to markets, to information, uh, and to economic opportunity. And finally, we see coordination as the, the third opportunity emerging, um, and that is to sort of put a variety of people into, the, uh, simply put them into um, conversation, right? Thinking about how we better connect our, the productivity of our region to our local markets, reconnect consumers to the food system, link our farmers to institutions, and better engage in planning and policy. So with that, I thank you. Thank you.